I'm glad that you can make it. My name is Sarah Hart. So once again, on behalf of the Bayou College of myself and the whole Federal Society eBoard, thank you for coming. I'd like to give a little background about our two speakers today. First, we have Mr. Josh Blackman. He's an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law in Houston and specializes in constitutional law. He also teaches a little bit of property. He was selected by Forbes Magazine for 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy and twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the Constitutionality of Executive Action. And by the way, go vote if you haven't voted, just sticking that in there, so don't care who you vote for, but get out there and do it. Um, so we have Mr. Blackman here who has been, you can see him on different news stations and constitutional issues, gun rights, um, everything such as that. So we're very happy to have Mr. Blackman here. We also have... I don't want to mispronounce your name, Mr. Schwanner. Schwanner. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't want to mispronounce it. I think so. <laughs> Mr. Schwanner um, graduated from Maumee Valley Country Day School. He teaches at MDC. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in sociology and anthropology from Denison University. They also have a master's and doctorate from Ohio State University. The Ohio State University. Yeah. The Ohio State. <laughs> um, he went on to earn numerous teaching and civil service work as a college professor at the University of Louisville, Sullivan University, and Miami Dade College. He has shaped and mobilized nearly 10,000 students in his career with his unorthodox and creative writing, intensive teaching style, and continues to leave an impact that reflects the lessons on race, grace, and the wisdom to overcome as learned from his life. So with that, thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's 3D gun debate. Thank you, thank you. Let me echo Terry's call. Go vote. If you haven't voted, please go vote today. Very um, It's a pleasure to be here at FIU. Uh, I've been here a few times before. I published in your law review a couple years ago, and it's a pleasure to be back. Um, you're in for a treat today. I am talking about not only one constitutional right, but two constitutional rights. Interaction of the First and Second Amendments and 3D printing. Now, I initially came about this topic as an academic. Years ago, guns. And I didn't think much of it, but after I wrote this article, I actually got a phone call from a company called Defense Distributed. They were the ones who actually made the 3D printed guns. And they said, Josh, we read your article. We want to sue the government. Will you represent us? So if you ever think that academia never goes anywhere in the real world, let this be a story to the opposite. So let's get started. Who here has ever used a 3D printer? Oh, wow, a couple of you. What'd you, what'd you make? It was an iPhone. Oh, that's pretty cool. What would you make? It looks like a block. It's like a block. A block, okay. Anyone else? Okay, Eiffel Tower, block. That's pretty cool. So what is 3D printing? 3D printing is a way of designing an object on a computer screen in three dimensions, and then you can translate it to an actual real-world object. You can design everything from a car to a house. And I want to give you a brief tutorial of how to use a 3D printer. So we all know back in high school geometry, a cylinder, right? Basically a bottle of water, right? A cylinder. If I tell you that I want a cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius or a width of five inches, you would know what that looks like, right? Height of five, 20, right? You know roughly what that looks like. If I were to give you a block of theory, you could take a clay and chisel it away and make a cylinder of that shape. If I gave you a piece of wood, in theory, you could make a cylinder of that shape. If I gave you a piece of metal, in theory, you could make a cylinder of that shape. Now, I am not talented. I am not skilled. I can't use clay. I can't use wood. I can't use metal. I am not dexterous at all. But 3D printing allows you to create objects that you may not otherwise be able to create with your own talent. And people create all sorts of little tchotchkes and things that aren't very important. But you can do things that are pretty cool. This is what a 3D printer looks like. You can see this little race car that's being printed over there. Pretty sophisticated stuff. How does it work? So who here, who here has made a candle, right? A candle. How do you make a candle? You take a wick, you 
wax you pull it out. You dip the wax, you pull it out, right? And you keep dipping it one after another after another. And each time you dip it, it gets a little thicker around the base, right? 3D printing works in the exact same fashion. But instead of dipping a candle in wax, you're spraying a very thin layer of liquid plastic that hardens. And this diagram shows how it works. You have this little nozzle over here. Oh my, my pointer's not working well. With a little nozzle over here, it sprays down and makes one layer at a time. And the base of the printer is actually heated. So when you put this sort of liquid plastic on, it heats it up. Okay, everyone understand this? I want to show you now a demonstration of how a 3D printer operates. And I'm going to show you a series of pictures in which an object is being created. When you see what's being created, I want you to shout out what you see, okay? Get it? I want to see how smart you guys are. So when you see it, shout it out. So first here is the bottom layer. It's a sort of honeycomb lattice, right? Shaped like hexagons. This is a very strong base to make something. So this is picture number one. Picture number two. Picture number three. Picture number four. You see it keeps getting stronger and stronger, higher and higher. Anyone see what it is yet? Any guesses? Number four. All right. Keep going. Number five. Frog, close. You're actually in the ballpark. Huh? Your frog is closer. <laughs> Six. A, a toad. Okay, that's like a frog. Good. <laughs> but you're in the ballpark, right? Was it? A what? I don't know what that is, but I'll keep going. Seven. Anyone see it yet? All right. Eight. Ooh. Anyone see it yet? Nine. Okay, now you got to see it. Bingo, who said it? Give him some fried chicken, right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, from Star Wars, right? Now you see it. Ah, oh, there it is. Now you see it, right? Ah, oh, Yoda, 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 right? There it is. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then they close off the top of the head. Done. That takes a few minutes to print out. If I use plastic play, But 3D printing lets you take ideas in the abstract that is only in a computer and translate them to real and easily. Ah, that's better. Less feedback. Thank you. Okay. So of course, given that we're in America, what do people want to 3D print? Guns. Guns, of course, right? This is this is why I'm here, right? If people were simply printing 3D Yodas, you wouldn't care much what I have to say. But I'm here to talk about 3D printed guns. In particular, the Liberator. The Liberator is the first fully functional 3D printed firearm. Now, what is this picture? This is the barrel of a Liberator. Right? This is the thing the bullet comes out of. And if you think about it, what's a barrel? It's a cylinder. Right? A barrel is basically a cylinder that bullet comes out of. I put a trick on you before. I to make a cylinder with a barrel. I play a little trick on you. I'm sorry. But the point is, these are not revolutionary designs. How you make them is tough. But the basic principles are simple. Code that translates to physical objects that can be used to make a cylinder. Defense distributed made other objects. Who knows what this is? It's an AR-15 lower receiver. This is the only part, part that the government cares about. Make your own AR-15 lower receiver. So defense distributed found a way to make a lower receiver. They also developed a way to make magazines, things that are inside the gun to hold the bullets. 
But what put the distributed on the map was this. What the hell is this, right? What, 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 what am I looking at? This is the liberator, right? These are the parts needed to make a fully functional single shot pistol. The blue thing is the handle, right, the thing you hold on to. The bullet is there. Oh, my pointer is not working with me today with this too far. The bullet is here. There's a nail there. The nail is used as a firing pin. Those little squiggly things are the springs. When you pull back the trigger, it snaps and actually strikes the back of the bullet. The gun is entirely plastic, except for the bullet and then This is what is If you notice, there's a rope on the floor. Why is there a rope on the floor? Well, when they were testing it, they didn't want to put their finger on the trigger. Right Maybe the early models blew up and pulled the trigger. So they would put a string on the trigger <laughs> and send far, far away and pull it. Now, it's an important point. The reason why guns are made out of metal is steel has a unique property. When steel gets hot, it expands. When steel cools off, it contracts. That's what you need for a gun. You pull the trigger, it gets really hot, it expands, and it cools down, goes back to normal. Plastic doesn't do that. It's very rigid and inflexible. And it's an absolutely awful way to make a gun. In fact, making a functional liberator requires a lot of work. It's not just point, click, shoot. You have to know exactly what you're doing. You have to have skill. You have to actually treat the plastic parts with a chemical bath of acetone to strengthen the plastic enough. And if you don't strengthen the plastic enough, it'll blow up in your hand. It's not strong enough. So it's actually a lot harder to make one of these guns than you might think. It's far easier to simply buy one legally or in the black market, or as I'll show you in a minute, make your own gun without a printer. Now, is this a problem, right? Is there anything illegal about printing your own firearm? Now, most people think this is what a 3D printer looks like. You just press a button and you know, this fully functional Glock pops out. Um, that's not how things work. It's a fairly rigorous process. Okay, but most people may not know this, perhaps in Florida, depending which part of Florida we're in, uh, that you can already make your own guns at home with something called a zip gun. Has anyone ever made a zip gun? Yeah, what'd you make? Yeah. Our school made it. Yeah. What kind of gun was it? Okay, I, I, I believe you. It, you made one? No. Anyone else? I don't. So a zip gun is a homemade gun. Yeah, you made one? No. Ted Cruz, right? Yeah, no, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I voted early. <laughs> he, actually, he actually had a funny tweet where he actually tweeted a picture of the Zodiac sign saying, Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> Look, you got to own it, right? Um, but a zip gun is basically a homemade gun. A gun you make at home. What is this? And a garden hose. If you weld together a soldering iron and the nozzle from a garden hose, you just made yourself a gun. I Googled, I Googled around in this. There are lots of instructions. These are my favorite. These are flashlights, keychains that are guns, right? If you look at this, oh, yeah, whatever, it's a keychain, right? It's a fully functional firearm, and it shoots one bullet. That's all you might need. Now, I want to show you how easy it is to make a gun at home. Now, listen to me very carefully. Do not try this at home, please. The thing I have to show you, these guys are morons. Do not try this at home, OK? So here we go. You know there's a flip phone camera, so this is legit, right? This is serious. <laughs> these guys have decided to make a rifle. With what? A rubber pipe a single shotgun shell, and a metal pipe. That's all you need to make a gun. It's very easy. So here's what happens. On the tip of this is a little dimple. 
in the back of a shotgun shell, it ignites the charge and it goes boom, right? So here's the go, here it goes, right? They load the shotgun shell into the rubber tube, which again would not trigger metal detector rubbers, not metal. And they're gonna jam the pipe in the back of the shotgun shell. Now, you are all reasonably prudent law students to torts, right? What is about this? Everything, but give me specific, right? What's really problematic about this picture? It's just there's so much, but just tell me. Yeah, in the back. The head looks like it's covering. Yeah, he's covering the, the rifle shell. Yeah, so that's bad. If you have 10 fingers, you might not want to do that, right? What else is really problematic about this picture? Yeah. Indoors, they're shooting into a cardboard box. One other thing that you might not see, look at the bottom right-hand corner. What is that? Electric. electric. Yeah, let me show you this picture. It's a little clearer. There's an electrical wire coming down, plugged into a fan. This is like Darwin of the Year Award, right? You know, this guy is a... Uh... But they're going to do it. You ready? And you can see there are actually holes in the box. They've done this before. What is that? <laughs> I won't say which. All right. <laughs> so ready? Three, two, one, boom. They didn't die, which is the good part, right? So they, they fire this bullet, and here they are boasting. You see a smoke shotgun shell. Now, why am I showing you this picture? I'm not trying to teach you how to make a rubber gun. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to illustrate is how easy it is, how cheap to make a functional firearm. Anyone can do it. With $15 worth of parts from Home Depot, right? I can go to Home Depot right now and buy all these parts. And by the way, the rubber thing would not trigger a metal detector at all. You could bring this anywhere you wanted. Shotgun shells have almost no metal in them. They're the, it's like a plastic rubbery cartridge. You could smuggle this gun wherever you wanted very easily. Okay, now. Did our friends with the flip phone break any law? Did they violate any federal law whatsoever? The answer is no. Under ATF rules, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm, it is perfectly legal to make your own firearm as long as you don't sell it. Important caveat. If you sell it, then you're in trouble. You need a license to do that. But if you make your own firearm and you're not putting it into commerce, you're fine. Uh, you can't have, for example, a machine gun. You can't have a short barrel shotgun. Those are the, basically the only big restrictions. So what these guys did was perfectly lawful. So why am I here, right? If it's perfectly legal to make your own 3D guns, then why am I writing this? The government isn't so concerned with the making of the 3D guns. The government's concerned with the distribution of information of how to make them. And that implicates the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, right? The users at the gate. That's what all sides be able to communicate. But you might say, wait a minute, Josh, this isn't really just speech. These are files that are used to make dangerous, dangerous items, right? How can you possibly say this is protected by the First Amendment? Well, a few points. First off, do you remember seeing the book, Florida, I'm sorry, Florida, uh, I'm in Florida, the Anarchist Cookbook, which was very popular in Florida. Uh, it is a standard for Florida now, right? The Anarchist Cookbook, right? Do you ever read this book or know about it? It's basically a hand guide to be a terrorist. I'm only slightly exaggerated, right? It's basically a guide of how to engage in acts of terrorism. Maybe how to make poison, how to make bombs, how to make explosives, etc. Okay? That's how this works. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a very strong effort to prohibit the anarchist cookbook. It failed. Even if speech can be used to teach you to do dangerous things, okay, 
it's still protected by the Constitution. Okay. You might say, wait a minute, Josh, we're not talking about a book here. We're talking about information. Let me tell you. The courts have consistently held that information is speech for, for purposes of the First Amendment. Even though you're using ones and zeros instead of paint and pencil, your speech is protected. And it court held that quote, the creation of information are and we increasingly live in a world that's governed by data. And the mere fact that you use expression on a computer doesn't deprive your expression of constitutional values. Okay. But I promise you two amendments and I get the second one. This is not only a case about the First Amendment, it's also a case about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Supreme Court had its first major decision on the Second Amendment in 2008 in a case called D.C. v. Heller which declared the District of Columbia's handgun ban to be unconstitutional. And two years later, the case of McDonald v. City of Chicago, and the court declared unconstitutional the City of Chicago's handgun ban. Why? Both violated the Second Amendment. Now, the court hasn't seen fit to revisit the Second Amendment since Heller and McDonald. They have, just haven't done it. But these cases represent a, an issue, right? How far can the government go in restricting your access to firearms? So I think there are two aspects of the Second Amendment that are at issue here. Wire arms. Right? Now, this. the government says, OK, if you already have a gun, you can keep it. But you can't actually have a right to acquire arms by one mean or another. Now, I'm not saying. Anyone can buy a gun, there's no restrictions. My point is that at a basic level, acquiring guns is implicated by the Second Amendment. The second one I'm actually a little bit more confident about. And that's what we call a right to make arms. So long before there was Walmart and Cabela's and other stores, if you wanted a gun, you'd have to make it yourself. And back in the day, you had the colonists, and they made muskets at home. So I think there is actually a right to manufacture your firearm. Now again, I'm not saying this is a right to whatever you want, but there's a basic right to make your own weapons, and the government has to justify any restriction upon that right to their adequate level of scrutiny. But I'm not done. There's a principle in law known as a hybrid right, where one right reinforces the other. And I'll give you an example. Let's say the government passes a law saying that it's a crime to wish one a Merry Christmas an actual war on Christmas, right? It's a crime to wish one a Merry Christmas. Is that a violation of free speech? Or is that a violation of your free exercise of religion? Or is it a violation of both? Or I'll give you another example. Let's not print a book about how to, uh, you know, make newspapers, right? You got free speech and free of the press being infringed. Here, I think we have a hybrid situation. Where the court, I'm sorry, where the government is basically censoring people about how to exercise the right to bear arms, right? They're speaking about how to make guns, which I think is protected by the Second Amendment. So even the first and second are strong by themselves. So what law actually exists now? A statute called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was enacted in 1988. Wait a minute. The 3D printed gun was made in 2012. How is it possible that Congress banned these in 1988? Let me tell you something, my friends. The 3D printed gun is not the first undetectable gun. What this statute says is a metal to trigger a metal detector. Okay? It's a 30 year old statute. Plastic guns are not new. Now, why did Congress in 1988 pass a statute? Because of our favorite handgun, the Glock. And this is first a very uh, uh, false perception of what the Glock actually was. And I blame Bruce Willis. 
Um, in the Die Hard movie, there's this one scene. I'm going to read it to you. I can't, I can't do it with Bruce's bravado, but I'll read it to you. He says, luggage, that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Every single aspect is false. None of it's true, okay? There is no Glock 7 that model doesn't exist. It's not made of porcelain, it's made of metal. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. So everything Bruce Willis said is false. What Congress does, they react laws banning stuff in movies. So we have this law in the books. But the Liberator complies with that statute. The instructions say you put a block of metal in there. Now, a block of metal is not operative. It doesn't really require it to be there. Take that out, you're in violation of federal law. So now, New York, uh, some years ago, wanted to ban it, unable to. Uh, uh, some people said we need to ban the materials, right? We need to ban plastic that can be used for 3D printing. Terminator 2. You can 3D print a fully functional steel 19 handgun, right? Um, you're not going to stop this. Why does this matter? A metal gun will be detectable, but you can make it on your own. So the ability to actually restrict the end product is somewhat limited, which is why so far the government has tried to restrict this using export control. But when you have a product in the United States, overseas, you generally need the government's permission. Right, and the thinking is we don't want you know our state of the art technology in the hands of the bad guy. So you know, if I want to send a Stinger missile to Afghanistan, I probably need the government's permission to do that. I think it's a, everyone thinks it's a reasonable rule. So there are a series of rules called ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, and this is a series of guidelines of how to ship information abroad. And this makes sense if you're actually shipping arms, weapons. But in our case, the Obama administration decided that arms includes not just physical arms, but also the information used to make them. All right. The government says we don't want you shipping out to foreign countries the blueprints to make a nuclear submarine. I'm with you, right? I, I think that's a good idea. But the files that issue in our were public domain. They were available. On And never before the government tried to censor the internet in this respect. They said, you can't put this file on the internet. Okay? And they sent a letter to the defense distributed saying, take down your files. Of speech. Okay? Now, let me give you a brief overview of the litigation. We originally filed our lawsuit in 2015 uh, against the State Department. We lost in the trial court. We got a split decision from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We almost got the en banc court to review it, but failed. And then the Supreme Court denied certiorari. We came back to the trial court, and we actually reached a settlement with the government. I think the government recognized that they were going to lose when this case went to a trial or summary judgment, and they, they settled with us. Then it got crazy. In the span of five days, I argued four temporary restraining order arguments. We got sued everywhere. So when the settlement was about to go into effect, we were In February in Pennsylvania, in Washington, all these states to stop us from publishing this information. I also beat the TRO in New Jersey. I beat the one in Pennsylvania. The last when we get to Washington, the court ruled against us. And the judge issued our favorite nationwide injections, which are also popular now, which blocked the internet from having these files online. It didn't just block us from doing it, it blocked any American from publishing these files. It was a global prior restraint of speech. We are currently living in the 
corporate the Supreme Court. So you have a nice preview of the case. Uh, uh, but to wind down, uh, th these are important issues, regardless of what you think about gun control. The government's asserting here power to censor speech on the internet, and it's a power that's never been done before. Not only the state, uh, sorry, not only the federal government asserting this power, but the state is asserting this power as well. I think there's a power that the government does not have. Thank you all so much. I welcome any of your questions, and I will uh, 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 turn over to my good uh, colleague, Professor Hey, Professor Thank you so much. Oh, she left? Uh, it reminded me of my daughter. I know almost everything there is to know about Pokemon because I have a 13-year-old and I have an 18-year-old who's now uh, attending college. Um, some of you look just a little bit older than my daughter. And I can, I can guarantee you this, is that I started teaching probably before most of you were born. Uh, the first time I taught a class was in 1987. I was actually a senior in college. And I won the first uh, undergraduate teacher of the year at Denison University. Then I won uh, teacher of the year at Ohio State. And as I was driving in today, I was actually driving in with a friend, uh, I started thinking about last night. I had a, uh, what do you call it, FaceTime? Is that what it's called? When you talk to someone on the phone and you know you can see their face and all that? I had a FaceTime with my girlfriend, my fiance, who actually lives in Arizona. And she lives in Arizona, and we're both Prince fans, and we met each other on the Prince website. right? And I've always been of the of, of the mentality that I'd rather meet you face to face than to meet you online. And then here I had this girlfriend, fiance, 2,000 miles away, who I'm on FaceTime. And then as I'm coming in, as I wake up in the morning, I'm listening to a conference call in China about a stock that I bought on a car that had artificial intelligence and deep learning as its main operative system uh, that is based upon this idea of electronic, um, uh, an electronic vehicle that is autonomous, it drives by itself. And I start to think about the last term paper I wrote in college, and I typed it, right? I typed my last paper, and now I take a look at the fact that you can communicate instantaneous around the world at any time with anyone through a cell phone. And I start to think about this idea. If you think about the fact that in my last 30 years, the technology has revolutionized the way in which we operate, the way in which our relationships um, are, are monitored, the way in which our relationships come to being, I never would have imagined in 1987 that I'd be in a discussion talking about 3D printers. We were still using mimeograph machines, which is where you type on this thing and you peel off the layers and you copy it down and now all of a sudden you had a print, right? And now we're talking about 3D printers and we're talking about guns. And I don't know if you know what that means, but as a sociologist, what that means is it's so often we live in a world in which we really don't see. Right? We live in a place where the phenomenon that define our lives are almost invisible to the eye. And I would like to say that you are very lucky to be living at the cusp of the greatest change human history has ever seen. You're entering into an era in which the law is being interpreted in ways that we haven't imagined before. And over the next 20, 30 years, if you age like I did, you're going to see revolutions take place um, regarding the way in which people live. Now, in terms of not seeing what you see, I'm big on this. It's a sociological concept that, that basically makes the assessment that all of the world that we see is socially constructed. Nothing exists except what we've come to define as existing. Donald Black, who is a sociology of law expert, made the argument that law doesn't exist. It only exists through an interpretation process in which people come to a common agreement. Right? So if things don't exist, and you're looking at me right now, and I have a tie on, and I have a suit on, and I have a coat, you think that somehow you have a knowledge of who I am. I have a PhD from Ohio State, I have an MBA, I have a master's in conflict management, I have a master's in public policy, and I have a master's degree in sociology. And I've won seven teaching awards, I've won the Outstanding uh, Citizens Award for designing um, homicide reduction programs for both Columbus, Louisville, Kentucky, and currently we're working on a uh, homicide reduction program here in Miami. And here's what you can't see. The reason I can design programs is because I see the world differently than you. I just do, right? 
you see a white male speaking in front of you. You can't see the kid who was raised in an African-American family. I was raised in a poor family. I was raised in a violent family, in a violent neighborhood. My everyday existence was surrounded by street gangs, drug traffickers, and everything else. I was violated as a child, I was abused as a child, and I went to one of the greatest high schools, Maui Valley Country Day School, in the state of Ohio. It's the number one rated school in Ohio. And the woman who raised me, her name is Bertha Green. You can read about her in Dear Mom, the book that I just wrote. Paramount uh, Productions wants me to write the screenplay because they want to transform her life into a feature-length film. We've had offers from Netflix and places like that. Bertha Green was a sharecropper from Deep South Arkansas. And she dropped out of school in the third grade. And when she was about 14 years old, her stepfather decided that he was going to kill her. So he took out a straight edge blade and went to go ahead and slice her throat. And as he went to slice her throat, she picked up a chair and she broke the chair over his head. And the knife went flying and she jumped over him and ran into a bedroom. And when she went into the bedroom, she picked out a gun that a store owner had given her because she knew, or he knew, that she was being abused by her stepfather. And when he came into the room with the knife back in his hand, she fired a shot at him and missed. And then he started to run, and she hit him three times in the back, and he fell into the driveway, and the guy came up and drove her away. The gun was illegal. There was nothing legal about it. However, what's interesting about the story is my mother was also abused as a child. She was abused to the point where you couldn't recognize that she had been tortured. I'm going to get into the torture, but it was very fascinating because she didn't want to have me. So, while she was deciding on whether she was going to have an adoption or abortion, this third grade dropout sharecropper from Arkansas stood up to her and said, Susie, this is my mother's name, I will raise your son for you. Okay. Very interesting story. But it was a very violent neighborhood. So as a child, right, when I stayed at Mom Green's house, I had a handgun underneath my pillow, and I had a shotgun in the corner. And I was always taught, don't be afraid to use it, and if you have to use it, you shoot the kill. And then I went in and became a social, oh, by the way, uh, in 1981, on November 1st, my mother tried to murder me, right? And when she did, I just thank God that she didn't have a gun to shoot me. So on the one hand, I'm in this world because Mama Green shot her father. And on the other hand, I'm thanking God that my mother didn't have a gun. And then when Irma Jean's daughter tried to murder her, what was interesting was she didn't have a gun either. So my mother, she continued to live because of the fact it wasn't a gun. So when it comes to like issues of gun control, I'm really confused. <laughs> because on the one hand, on the one hand, I'm here because of honestly an illegal act. But on the other hand, I'm here because my mother didn't have a weapon. So when I start to take a look at gun control, I see it from a, 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 a entirely different lens than you. I see it from the view of a phenomenologist, which is this: phenomenologists make the argument that all of our life is a process of becoming. We go from birth until where we are now, and we learn to become who we are. We are an outcome of all the phenomena that shape our lives. And as that outcome is, we can't remember everything that happened to us, right? But we can remember certain types of things. Well, phenomenology just doesn't apply to your life. It applies to culture as well. So as we take a look at the world in which we live, there are phenomena happening every moment of every single day that we can't see, right? And in those moments, it is redefining the culture in which we live. Cultural lag theory makes the argument that it takes 50 years for a culture to adapt to technological change. Yet our technology is changing instantaneous right in front of us, and we're supposed to adapt to what these cultural changes are. And the problem is, is that there's no precedent for what we're looking at. So what happens is, is on these printed margins with the 3D printer, it becomes so blurry that it's almost, almost impossible to interpret what direction we should go in and what direction we have gone in and where we stand at any given moment. So, unfortunately, I can't, I can't debate him. He has me convinced that this is absolutely right. I never knew I could build a shotgun in my house. I'm not going to try. <laughs> I'm not going to try because I would hit the electric cord. I've almost burned the house down before trying to change a, a, a face plate, right? But I do look at homicide. I'm an expert in looking at patterns of homicide, and I'm an expert in looking at patterns of suicide. And one of the things I know is that if you go back to 1992 when it was crazy, and we we're coming out of crap wars, our level of homicide was here, right? Stop watching the news, please. Because the news has it all wrong when it comes to violent crime, or at least mostly wrong. 
And here's what I know. Since 1992, the rate of violent crime has been like this, particularly homicide. I always look at homicide. The only reason I look at homicide is it's the only accurately documented crime that exists. If someone took her computer, she may not report it to the police. If you take my phone, I don't have time to report that you took my phone. I'd rather just go spend the money. So if this larceny theft took place and I don't report it, it doesn't exist. But if I get shot, someone's going to report it. Right? If, so, if a homicide takes place, I'm going to report it. So given that, the only data that I can use to accurately assess, what our, uh, assess what's happening in society is homicide data and suicide data. By the way, I was able to predict that Donald Trump is going to beat Hillary Clinton in the election based upon homicide data and based upon suicide data. It was really simple. Because if you take a look at the rate of homicide, right, it's going like this. In 2008, according to sociological theory, criminological theory, the rate of crime should have gone back up. But it continued to go down. That's important. Why? Because those people who have historically been the ones who are most prone to violence, those between 16 and 24, didn't adapt to that change in the economic system violently. And why is that important? The reason is, is because of Bulbasaur, right? And, and, and Pikachu, and my man Blaziken, right? Because when I go home, my daughters are doing things, they're making videos and posting them on YouTube. My one, my 13 year old, she's getting paid for this. I said, how do you do that? Because I need a pay increase. <laughs> so what happened? Between 1992 and 2018, two things happened. One, the population got older. Right, the baby boomers are older now, which by definition is going to suppress the level of violent crime. But two, technology has changed the routines in which individuals live. So those persons who in the past would have been most prone to the surge in crime in 2008 didn't turn to crime. They continued to stay away from it. Except for one group. Young African American men between 18 and 24 from 2008 until 2016 saw a slight 6% increase. White males between the ages of 45 and 54 saw a predominant increase in the level of suicide. So when I took a look at the data, I said, what is unique about these two groups? Because we don't think of white men 45 to 54 as being very similar structurally to African American men between the ages of 18 and 24. And here's what we know. Remember I said the stream? We're both influenced by the same stream, by the same economic and cultural forces. So what does that mean? That means that if homicide is an external expression of economic forces and suicide is an internal expression of suicidal forces, that means the same forces are shaping the two people. And here's what I figured. I figured white males between 45 and 54 were not going to vote for Hillary Clinton because their life condition became worse after Barack Obama got elected. And African American men could not turn around and vote for Donald Trump. So they would stay away from the polls. And if you go look at the polling data, you go to Chicago, you go to Detroit, you go to Philadelphia, it was an exact inverse in terms of voting practices from the past. Okay. So what does all this mean? It means I don't know. I don't know what to say, except this. Right? There is a stream of homicidal violence that exists. And on the fringe margins are concerns that I have about different persons getting access to guns and weapons illegally. My mother, though she and I had a tenuous relationship at best, let me tell you a little story about my mom. She was a conspiracy theorist. And she was con a conspiracy theorist expert. The book, why don't you call that? Yeah, yeah, I've heard all about that for years. Right? My mother told me in 1990 that there was a group called the Michigan Militia that lived in Michigan that were planning to uh, protect America and our sovereignty from the government. And what she told me was is that there is a group out there who plans on blowing up a federal building. I said, Mom, come on. You know what I'm saying? I said, that, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that. And she said, look, Sean, there's a thing, a book called the Turner Diaries. Right? And the Turner Diaries are basically a, a, a cookbook, so to speak, of a revolution against the government. And in 1992, Timothy McVeigh, who was an adamant follower of the Turner Diaries, took a bomb and blew up the mural building in Oklahoma City, in which 265 people died. 
right? Now, I don't think, personally, that printing 3D guns, making homemade guns, or anything like that are going to have really any impact on overall rates of crime. Why? Because the stream is what it is. In certain extreme circumstances, maybe someone will. My concern would be more about suicide than it would be homicide with a, with a 3D gun or a homemade gun or something like that. But my concern is, is on the fringe. On the far out fringe, on the left or the right, somebody who is dominated by an ideological perspective of destruction and can't get access legally to guns, to firearms, and things like that, using those documents as the Turner Diaries, as a cookbook or an instructional guide into causing mass mayhem. Right? So, on the one hand, overall, there's not going to be much of an impact on overall crime rates. It's just not. Right? Because the aging of the population and changing routines is just going to have a predominant force on how violence expresses itself. Right? And on the fringe margin, we're only talking about a handful of people. Do you ever find it interesting? I do. This is why I stopped watching the news, which I'm embarrassed to say, is that when the gun control debate comes in, it typically happens after a mass shooting with a military-style assault weapon. Right? Then we take a look at everyone on the left and the right and get into all these debates and all these arguments as to whether or not you should be able to purchase them, whether or not you can do this. Guess what? 68 to 71% of all homicides for the last 50 years have happened with a handgun. So we have these uh, debates about the assault weapon as a way of focusing attention over here, but it focuses attention away from the most common form of homicide. How do people communicate with one another? I think where we're shooting the air ball is we get involved in, and I love this debate about the First and Second Amendment, I love that. I can do that all day. It's the difference between a deontological perspective, which is where we look at the act, versus a teleological perspective, where we look at the outcome, right? So I take a look at this, and I'm like, this is so fascinating. It's fascinating to me because we live in this world in which change is happening so fast that it is blurring our ability to actually see what's in front of us. And this is why I'm so excited. I wish I, if I was your age right now, I'd be a law school. Because I would love to be on the cutting edge of these cultural changes, these legalistic changes, and being a person uh, like uh, Professor Blackman over here who can actually in input and execute changes that are going to occur for everybody in the nation. And my conclusion is, it's too blurry for me to make an opinion. I can't make an opinion, right? Because I don't know what the answer is. And I think when I hear about the discussions you were talking about before, before we came in here, about discussions of First Amendment, we do see this ongoing interpretation of what is real from what is not real, from fact, from fiction, from truth, from ideology. And I think in that domain, you have a beautiful career in front of you. Just remember, there's one thing I'd like for you to remember. We are all a part of the same stream, right? These arbitrary boundaries that people have over one another are, are used for separation. I'd love for you as you move forward with your legal career to think about being in the middle of the stream and the fact that you can impact the direction of that stream based upon doing ethical work and doing work that I think is really important. Uh, that's about all I have to say. I'd like for you to direct all your questions over here because I really can't answer any. Um, I hope that's okay. Thank you very much for having me. All right, we have five minutes for Q&A. I don't know how to top it. That was, uh, that was, that was wonderful. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, are there any questions for me or for Mr. Farmer? Questions? Don't ask me questions. Ask him questions. Don't ask him questions. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'll start. And Please. One. Maybe that'll warm people up. So how do you feel about uh, not being able to track these? Um, <clears throat> so the question is, you can hear, how do you feel that you can't track these guns? Um, my initial response is there are lots of things you can't track. Um, the fact that you have this small number of guns that, um, uh, aren't registered, uh, uh, isn't that much different than other types of guns, but I'll answer it in a way that might surprise you. If the government wants to require you to register the guns that you print or the guns that you make, that's a very different story than whether they can restrict you from accessing the information of how to make them. And there are some states that have actually attempted to require registration of homemade firearms. I'm not going to opine, but I think those laws are valid. But I think the state has a much easier burden to justify the registration laws than they have to justify the threshold question whether you can share the information. So I think you have to separate the act of sharing information with the printing of them. 
Uh, very few people actually download these files actually end up ever making them. They're not actually made. They're just used as like a trivia, you know, something to happen to your computer. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, you you can make you can make a multi-round gun, right, out of metal. The limitation with plastic is it sucks, right? It's not, it's very brittle, and whenever you try and heat up plastic, it gives you breaks. So to the extent that you want to make a very good 3D printed metal gun, you might spend fifty thousand dollars on it, right? It's not cheap. You can go somewhere in Miami, not too far from here, on the street corner somewhere, and buy a gun for probably how, what's it going right now? How much? Is that, is that the going rate? Yeah. So, I mean, look, if you want to buy a gun, you're prohibited. You can buy it for pretty cheap. So making it on your computer is not a good way of getting an illegal gun. There are much easier and cheaper ways of getting one. Yes, sir. Uh, as one, I was learning about the comms problem, which yeah. Right, so the question was about the commerce clause, and to be precise, it's a commerce and necessary and proper clause. Make sure professors tell you any commerce clause case you get, Wickard, they're actually necessary and proper clause cases. Trust me on this one. It's always substantial effects is necessary and proper, not commerce clause. But so the question, what if you make a local gun, right? You make it totally a part within your state. Um, some states have actually tried this. You know, they, they call it the, was it the Montana gun or the Wyoming gun, I can't remember, where they have only local metal, local bullets, everything. Um, unfortunately, under the court's jurisprudence, if your local gun has a substantial effect in interstate commerce, then the feds can regulate it. So I think the feds can regulate the end product. Where they can't do is shut down the sharing of the information and make it. I think that's the key distinction I have to draw. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I guess a question for both, but um, are there, what, do you know of any recent data on, on homicides and incidents where the gun has been established that, that was used in that incident was 3D printed? Uh, the number is zero. Yeah, um, the, 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 there was one case where a guy made his own AR-15 lower, where you can mill your own lower receiver, and then he used that to inflict a homicide. Um, that's one I'm aware of, but that wasn't a 3D printed gun. Again, these are not very good guns. They're more likely to blow up in your hand than to actually shoot someone. They're, they're, these are mostly show pieces, which is why people get so afraid of them. Yeah. Fridays, I teach a class, a specialized class at um, NBC, where I have chiefs, captains, sergeants, lieutenants, all the executives. And I posed this question on Friday when I thought maybe I was coming. Yeah. And none of them agreed with 3D printing. One, they're not traceable. Two, they want a serial number on it. Um, so they were against it. But they weren't against the ownership of firearms. Um, but of course, I don't know how much research they've done on the plasticity. Uh, and, and the actual capabilities of those guns, but it was a knee-jerk reaction that nobody should be able to be able to print 3D guns, but they didn't say anything about whether or not I should be able to put out the plan for people to, to download it. It was just a knee-jerk reaction. Their answer was no. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Cops wanted their jobs to be as easy as possible. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, in the back. So the question here, if you can hear, is what about plants making a legal weapon? Usually someone asks me about bump stock, they like they're making a nuclear bomb or, or you know, or, or a missile launcher, or something that, that, that is illegal. Um, I think in the abstract, if the government wanted to draft a narrowly tailored statute that prohibits certain types of weapons that are prohibited, they perhaps could. Um, but the difficulty of drafting that statute is what's called overbreath, right? You're going to sweep in a lot of speech that is protected. And I don't know how you could draft a statute like that. Uh, for my stake, what's easy is we don't have such a statute, right? The statutes are fairly open-ended, and they, they sweep on a lot of protected speech without precision. 
So when you're talking about speech, you have to have narrow tailoring. I think it's the current laws we have don't, don't achieve that goal. But it's a very good question. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Is someone that is carrying and concealing a, a 3D printed gun charged at the same time as someone that carries and conceals a real gun? Well, if they're carrying a 3D printed guns, there's no metal in it, right? If, they, because if it's strictly plastic, it's a federal offense. So it's a violation of the carry law might be. Uh, but it's also a violation of the federal law, the Indetectable Firearms Act. That's the Bruce Willis law. Make sense? Okay. Other questions? Okay. Go on. Thank you all so much. Yes, we want to thank both our